At present, we don't have to burn fossil fuels. We don't have to use anything that would contaminate the environment. There are many sources of energy available. Alternative energy solutions pushed by the establishment, such as hydrogen, biomass, and even nuclear, are highly insufficient, dangerous, and exist only to perpetuate the profit structure that industry has created. When we look beyond the propaganda and self-serving solutions put forth by the energy companies, we find a seemingly endless stream of clean, abundant, and renewable energy for generating power. Solar and wind energy are well known to the public, but the true potential of these mediums remains unexpressed. Solar energy, derived from the sun, has such abundance that one hour of light at high noon contains more energy than what the entire world consumes in a year. If we could capture one hundredth of a percent of this energy, the world would never have to use oil, gas, or anything else. The question then is not availability, but the technology to harness it. And there are many advanced mediums today which could accomplish just that, if they were not hindered by the need to compete for market share with the established energy power structures. Then there's wind energy. Wind energy has long been denounced as weak and due to being location driven, impractical. This is simply not true. The U.S. Department of Energy admitted in 2007 that if wind was fully harvested in just three of America's 50 states, it could power the entire nation. And then there are the rather unknown mediums of tidal and wave power. Tidal power is derived from tidal shifts in the ocean. Installing turbines which capture this movement generates energy. In the United Kingdom, 42 sites are currently noted as available forecasting that 34 percent of all the UK's energy could come from tidal power alone. Wave power, which extracts energy from the surface motions of the ocean, is estimated to have a global potential of up to 80,000 terawatt hours a year. This means 50 percent of the entire planet's energy usage could be produced from this medium alone. Now it is important to point out that tidal wave, solar, and wind power requires virtually no preliminary energy to harness, unlike coal, oil, gas, biomass, hydrogen, and all the others. In combination, these four mediums alone, if efficiently harnessed through technology, could power the world forever. That being said, there happens to be another form of clean, renewable energy which trumps them all. Geothermal power. Geothermal energy utilizes what is called heat mining, which, through a simple process using water, is able to generate massive amounts of clean energy. In 2006, an MIT report on geothermal energy found that 13,000 zettajoules of power are currently available in the Earth, with the possibility of 2,000 zettajoules being easily tappable with improved technology. The total energy consumption of all the countries on the planet is about half of a zettajoule a year. This means about 4,000 years of planetary power could be harnessed in this medium alone. And when we understand that the Earth's heat generation is constantly renewed, this energy is really limitless and could be used forever. These energy sources are only a few of the clean, renewable mediums available. And as time goes on, we will find more. The grand realization is that we have total energy abundance without the need for pollution, traditional conservation, or in fact, a price tag. And what about transportation? The prevailing means of transportation in our societies is by automobile and aircraft, both of which predominantly need fossil fuels to run. In the case of the automobile, the battery technology needed to power an electric car that can go over 100 miles an hour for over 200 miles on one charge exists, and has existed for many years. However, due to battery patents controlled by the oil industry, which limits their availability to maintain market share, coupled with political pressure from the energy industry, the accessibility and affordability of this technology is limited. There is absolutely no reason other than pure, corrupt profit interest that every single vehicle in the world cannot be electric and utterly clean, with zero need for gasoline. As far as airplanes, it is time we realize that this means of travel is inefficient, cumbersome, slow, 
and causes far too much pollution. This is a maglev train. It uses magnets for propulsion. It is fully suspended by a magnetic field and requires less than 2% of the energy used for plane travel. The train has no wheels so nothing can wear out. The current maximum speed of versions of this technology as used in Japan is 361 miles per hour. However, this version of the technology is very dated. An organization called ET3, which has connections with the Venus Project, has established a tube-based maglev that can travel up to 4,000 miles per hour in a motionless, frictionless tube, which can go over land or underwater. Imagine going from LA to New York for an extended lunch break, or from Washington DC to Beijing, China in two hours. This is the future of continental and intercontinental travel, fast, clean, with only a fraction of the energy usage we use today for the same means. In fact, between maglev technology, advanced battery storage, and geothermal energy, there would be no reason to ever burn fossil fuels again. And we can do this now, if we were not held back by the paralyzing profit structure. Now America is inclined toward fascism. It has a propensity by its dominant philosophy and religion to uphold the fascist point of view. American industry is essentially a fascist institution. If you don't understand that, the minute you punch that time clock, you walk into a dictatorship. We're given notions about the respectability of work, and um, I really look at it as being paid slavery. They're brought up to believe that you shall earn your living by the sweat of your brow. That holds people back, freeing people from drudgery, repetitive jobs which make them ignorant. You rob them. In our society, that is a resource-based economy, machines free people. You see, we can't imagine that because we've never known that kind of world. If we look back at history, we see a very clear pattern of machine automation slowly replacing human labor. From the disappearance of the elevator man to the near full automation of an automobile production plant, the fact is, as technology grows, the need for humans in the workforce will continually be diminished. This creates a serious clash, which proves the falseness of the monetary-based labor system. For human employment is in direct competition with technological development. Therefore, given the fundamental priority of profit by industry, people through time will be continually laid off and replaced by machine. When industry takes on the machine, instead of shortening the workday, they downsize. You lose your job. So you have a right to fear machines. In a high technology, resource-based economy, it is conservative to say that about 90% of all current occupations could be phased out by machines, freeing humans to live their life without servitude. For this is the point of technology itself. And through time, with nanotechnology and other highly advanced forms of science, it is not far-fetched to see how even complex medical procedures could be performed by machines as well. And based on the pattern, with much higher success rates than humans get today. The path is clear, but our monetary-based structure, which requires labor for income, blocks this progress, for humans need jobs in order to survive. The bottom line is that this system must go, or we will never be free, and technology will be constantly paralyzed. When you have machines that clean out sewers, it frees a human being from doing that. So look at machines as extensions of human performance. Furthermore, many occupations today will have simply no basis to exist in a resource-based economy, such as anything associated with the management of money, advertising, along with the legal system itself. For without money, a great majority of the crimes that are committed today would never occur. Virtually all forms of crime are a consequence of the monetary system, either directly or by neuroses, inflicted through financial deprivation. 
Therefore, laws themselves could eventually become extinct. Instead of putting up a sign, drive carefully, slippery when wet, put abrasive in the highway so it's not slippery when wet. And if a person gets in a car that drunk and the car oscillates a great deal, there's a little pendulum that swings up and back and that'll pull the car over the side. Not a law. Solution. Put sonar and radar in automobiles so they can't hit one another. Man-made laws are attempts to deal with occurring problems and not knowing how to solve them, they make a law. In the United States, the most privatized capitalist country on the planet, it should come as no surprise that it also has the largest prison population in the world, growing every year. Statistically, most of these people are uneducated and come from poor, deprived societies. And, contrary to propaganda, it is this environmental conditioning which lures them into criminal and violent behavior. However, society looks the other way in regard to this point. The legal and prison systems are just more examples of how our society avoids examining the root causes of behavior. Billions are spent each year on prisons and police, while only a fraction is spent on programs for poverty, which is one of the most fundamental variables responsible for crime to begin with. And as long as we have an economic system which prefers and in fact creates scarcity and deprivation, crime will never go away. If people have access to the necessities of life without servitude, debt, barter, trade, they behave very differently. You want all these things available without a price tag. Now then, you've got to have a price tag. Well, what will motivate people? A uh, man gets everything he wants, he just lay around in the sun. This is the myth they perpetuate. People in our culture are trained to believe that the monetary system produces incentive. If they have access to things, why should they want to do anything? They will lose their incentive. That's what you're taught to support the monetary system. When you take money out of the scenario, there would be different in incentives, very different incentives. When people have access to the necessities of life, their incentives change. What about the moon and the stars? New incentives arise. If you make a painting that you enjoy, you will enjoy giving it to other people, not selling it. I think most of the education that I've seen today is essentially producing a person for a job. It's very specialized. They're not generalists. People don't know a lot about a lot of different subjects. I, I don't think you could get people to go to war if, if they knew a lot about a lot of things. I think education is mostly rote and they're not taught how to solve problems. They're not given the tools emotionally or within their own field of how to do critical thinking. A resource-based economy, the education would be very different. Our society's major concern is mental development and to motivate each person to their highest potential. Because our philosophy is the smarter people are, the richer the world, because everybody becomes a contributor. The smarter your kids are, the better my life will be because they'll be contributing more constructively to the, to the environment and to my life because everything that we devise within a resource-based economy would be applied to society. There would be nothing to hold it back. Patriotism, weapons, armies, navies, all that is a sign that we're not civilized yet. Kids will ask their parents, didn't you see the necessity? of machines? Dad, couldn't you see that war was inevitable when you produce scarcity? Isn't it obvious? Of course the kid will understand that you were pinheads raised merely to serve the established institutions. We're such an abominable, sick society that we won't make the history book. They just say that large nations took land from smaller nations, used force and violence. You'll get history talked about as corrupt behavior all the way along until the beginning of the civilized world. That's when all the nations work together 